The Empire of Business, Section 14, Wages. The two schools of socialism, evolutionary and revolutionary, differ upon the crucial question of wages, although it is fundamental and must be settled one way or the other. For until it is, what socialism really means cannot be known. If wages are not to be equal, all classes cannot be merged and kept uniform, the basis of socialism. We quote from several socialistic sources. Quote, socialism forbids the future use of property as private means of production or private source of income, and thus necessarily puts an end to inequalities of income, unquote. Quote, socialism is that mode of social life which, based upon the recognition of the natural brotherhood and unity of mankind, would have land and capital owned by the community collectively and operated cooperatively for the equal good of all, unquote. Quote, our aim, one and all, is to obtain for the whole community complete ownership and control of the means of transport, the means of manufacture, the mines and the land. Thus, we look to put an end forever to the wage system to sweep away all distinctions of class and eventually to establish national and international communism on a sound basis, unquote. Quote, the land being the storehouse of the necessaries of life should be declared and treated as public property. The capital necessary for industrial operations should be owned and used collectively. Work and wealth resulting therefrom should be equitably distributed over the population, unquote. Quote, controversy, unquote, writes Mrs. Annie Besant, quote, will probably arise as to the division. Shall all the shares be equal? Or shall the workers receive in proportion to the supposed dignity or indignity of their work? Inequality, however, would be odious. The impossibility of estimating the separate value of each man's labor with any really valid result, the friction which would arise, the jealousies which would be provoked, the inevitable discontent, favoritism, and jobbery that would prevail, all these things will drive the communal council into the right path, equal remuneration of all workers, unquote. Quote, socialism we believe to be the next step in the evolution of that form of state which will give the individual the fullest and freest room for expansion and development. State socialism, with all its drawbacks, and these I frankly admit, will prepare the way for free communism, in which the rule, not merely the law of the state, but the rule of life, will be from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs, unquote. Notwithstanding the foregoing, Mr. Hardy ventures to aver in another place that, quote, the socialist state, therefore, will have good reason to honor the inventor and will have a direct interest in rewarding him as a public benefactor, unquote. If already honored, one wonders what form further reward could take without differentiating him from others. Upon the other side, we quote from Mr. Jowett's booklet in the Labor Ideal series, The Socialist and the City, pages 17, 18, and 19. This deliverance is so vitally important that we give it at length. Quote, at present, all the larger corporations are trying to monopolize for their own service a number of experts insufficient to go round. The result is that some of them are paying first-class salaries for second- or third-class men. There will be no need for this when cities cease to compete with each other, and one may naturally expect that socialist cities would abolish this least vestige of competition 
still remaining between different municipal corporations. The associated corporations will be able to pay sufficiently large salaries, and each individual corporation requiring a specialist's assistance might pay consultation fees into a common pool. Joint action in this direction will tend to steady the movements of experts and officials, and for the rest, it should be looked upon as a discreditable proceeding on the part of a man holding, say, a responsible post as engineer, surveyor, architect, or other similar profession, to transfer his services after committing the community to some large scheme involving great outlay until the work is sufficiently near completion for the responsibility to be properly placed in case of failure. It is no part of the socialist plan to run municipal concerns under the control of the managerial leavings of private enterprise, for that way disaster lies." Unquote. Here we have a revelation. Nothing new is to be obtained by Mr. Jowett's brand of socialism, except that socialistic cities are to combine, which they do not do under present conditions, and agree not to offer a higher reward for labor, thus robbing other cities of their valuable men. No competition for labor. Valuable men are to be compelled to remain where they are, no chance of escape. What do our friends of labor think of this? Ability, as today, will look for and receive high rewards, and cities through their governors will condescend to combine to thwart service receiving the reward, which, under the free play of forces, it would command. In the necessary basis of society, Contemporary Review, June 1908, page 664, Mr. Sidney Webb, who tells us he is a socialist, writes as follows, quote, The most democratic government of the ensuing century, based as it must necessarily be, on the very idea of providing for each of the series of minorities of which the world is made up, is as likely to provide for one minority as for another, for its poets as for its apprentices, for its scientists as for its soldiers, for its artists as for its artificers, and with the advance of actual knowledge in the administration is even more likely to know how they can be fostered and really well provided for than the irresponsible plutocratic patron ever did." Unquote. Another eminent authority, Mr. H. G. Wells, in his recent book, differs from both sides quoted. The state is not to take over all branches of industrial production, but only half. He declares, quote, a little moiety, or little short of a moiety, of the business of such a country as England must always be in the hands of men who are the masters of their own enterprises and are not the salaried officials of any larger organization whatsoever. Labor is not to be paid equal wages or according to its needs. Socialism does not propose to abolish competition as many hasty and foolish antagonists declare. If the reader has gone through what has preceded this, he will know that this is not so. Socialism trusts to competition for the service and improvement of the world, and in order that competition between man and man may have free play, socialism seeks to abolish one particular form of competition the competition to get and hold property, even to marry property, that degrades our present world. But it would leave men free to compete for fame, for service, for salaries, for position and authority, for leisure, for love and honor." Unquote. 
socialism must either establish equality of wages, for thus only can it maintain uniformity of living, or retain the present system of inequality of wages involving variety of living. If the former were adopted, human life would be changed with results unknown. No wonder Mr. Hardy relegates the consideration of that question to the future, for he is undoubtedly right in saying man is not today prepared for such a change. Those whose services command more than the common laborer would not agree. Such is human nature as it stands today, and the idea of uniform income may be dismissed until the nature of man changes. On the other hand, if different wages be paid according to service rendered, socialism becomes impossible. As Mr. Spargo says, quote, there must be approximate equality of income, otherwise class formations must take place, and the old problems incidental to economic inequality reappear, unquote. Here is a step which socialism must overleap or else fall down. Mr. Ramsey MacDonald, MP, is a philosophic socialist who writes well. He tells us, quote, if the socialist state is ever to come, it is not by a sudden change in economic and personal relationships, but by a steady readjustment of existing relationships until the organic structure has been completely altered, unquote. Never were truer words written. Would that all socialists apprehended that they are fatal to the realization of the socialistic state with its uniform incomes and abolition of private property, not only during our time, but until or unless, quote, the organic structure be completely altered, unquote. Man's progress in the past has been steady, and he has traveled upward from savagery, but long is the road and devious the way to complete change of the organic structure of the economic and personal relationships of human society. Yet this must be reached before socialism as a system can be introduced. Strange that such men as we have quoted, fit for leaders of their fellows in assaults upon the numerous evils of our day, should waste their powers upon a system which they admit cannot be adopted until organic changes take place in the structure of human society. We have before us the work of our own day and generation, and only this can we push forward during our lives. To this it is our duty to devote ourselves, leaving the work of the distant future to our successors, Rare are the men capable of dealing wisely with the needs of their own time. Even with these, their success is often not surprisingly brilliant. We have not been blessed with men capable of legislating properly for generations to come. They do not and cannot exist. Meanwhile, in view of the conflicting views expressed, we shall surely be excused for asking the socialists for an authoritative answer to the question whether socialism involves equal wages or whether the present individualistic mode of payment according to service rendered is to be retained or Mr. Wells's half-and-half -half system to be adopted. The most devoted disciple of socialism must realize that this constitutes one of the two vital differences between the individualistic and socialistic systems, the other being the right of private property, that it is fundamental and lies at the root of the whole matter. No equal wages, no socialism possible. Equal wages, no individualism possible, half-equal and half-unequal wages, 
endless confusion. We leave the revolutionary, the evolutionary, and the half-and-half -half socialists to study the problem and decide. Until it is solved, socialism remains a mere babble of words signifying nothing for this is not a mere incident in its progress. It stands at the threshold and demands settlement. End of section 14.